plate finite elements are very important in the finite element codes. There are many different theories from which they can be derived, and then there are many ways to implement the theories. An additional complication is that the typical plate element is numerically integrated, and it only exists for a brief moment in the mind of the computer, and therefore the user does not get to see the stiffness matrix that's developed. For that reason, I tend to teach a simpler theory and a simpler plate element so that we can see the results in, in hard form in front of us. There are two major plate theories and a number of shell theories. The plate theory that we'll concentrate on will be the Kirchhoff-Love theory following our experience with the classical theory. The two great plate theories are the Midland theory and the Kirchhoff-Love theory. The situation is a little bit similar as in beam theory where you have the Euler-Bernoulli theory where plane sections remain plane and then that's relaxed in the Timoshenko theory where there's shearing deformations allowed. Now in the plate element formulation you can either use the uh, Kirchhoff-Love theory where plane sections remain plane and perpendicular to the neutral surface or you can use the Menlin theory which is becoming more popular now which allows shearing deformations. Um, one particular reference on the Menlin theory is uh, Tom Hughes finite element textbook that I'll reference on the title page. But we will take the simpler approach. It's easier to teach the uh, Kirchhoff-Lev theory. It's easier to discuss the variables. And, and we can actually show an example in the Mosh zinkevich chung rectangle, which will be a 12 degree of freedom rectangular plate flexural element. Now I have to say some fancy words here to please the theoreticians that um, if you have the Mendelin type theories where you don't enforce plane sections remaining plane and you do relax this assumption and allow shear deformation, then you only require continuity from element to element on the displacement of the lateral deflection itself. That's called C0 continuity. And that means you only require continuity to the zero derivative of the lateral displacement. But the Kirchhoff-Love theory, although it's a simpler theory, requires continuity of the first derivative. And uh, that's sometimes called a C1 theory. So we're going to do the C1 theory based on Kirchhoff-Love and ultimately a simple rectangular element. Now we will get to business on the MZC rectangle, the Malash Sienkiewicz Chung rectangle. There are two ways one, one could approach this, and, and the first is to use the three-dimensional stress and strain field and integrate the relevant finite element integral for stiffness over the volume of the plate. An alternate way is a little easier, and that's to use the moment and force resultants and deal more in the force resultant space where you integrate over the plan area of the plate. So we'll do the latter approach. Sometimes this is called generalized stress and strain when you deal with those uh, force and moment resultants. Now, basically, we're going to look at a rectangular finite element with four nodes at the four vertices, and we're going to consider the lateral deflection as perhaps the dominant variable in the problem. In fact, it's going to be the only field variable in the interior that we will keep track of as the plate um, humps up. On the other hand, at the nodes, we want to bookkeep with the rotation. So we will also look at the rotation about the x-axis and the rotation about the y-axis at each of the nodes. And then you can see the subscripting convention on the variables. We're interested, therefore, in an element that has 12 degrees of freedom at the nodes. And we know that we're going to need 12 internal degrees of freedom. So we'll have to develop the variables to be consistent. Here's a flow chart of the nodal force-like quantities and the nodal displacement-like quantities. Of course, in turn, they form work 
uh, in dimensionally when you multiply the displacement times the force or the moment times the angle here. Um, the field variable is a single one of the lateral displacement. It will be mapped from the nodal displacements. And we'll get back to that in a minute. We'll use the displacement function approach with a polynomial that has 12 generalized coordinates. Then we need a relation here to define the curvatures in terms of that um, neutral surface deflection. Here we need a material law, which is going to be a, a generalized stress-strain law, or more typically called a moment curvature law. And those are written out below. First, the red matrix is the moment curvature law, and it has terms that reflect an orthotropic behavior. We're going to allow different stiffness in the x and the y direction. And uh, so we have these different components, dx, dy, and a coupling term, d1, and then this twisting stiffness, dxy. The curvatures are defined in terms of the lateral displacements through these second derivatives. And um, there are the uh, curvatures in the x and the y direction, and then this twisting term, sometimes called Gaussian curvature. Now we'll choose a displacement polynomial to represent the lateral deflection of the plate over the entire surface of the plate. And this uh, polynomial is an incomplete quartic. It doesn't have all of the terms. I show that below using the Pascal triangle. But we've done it in a way to keep the situation geometrically isotropic. That is, we treat the x and the y variables in the same uh, fair way in terms of accuracy. A key concept, both in beam theory and in plate theory, is to relate the nodal displacements to the internal field variable. For the plate, we have the two dimensions to worry about. Let's start with the rotation about the x-axis at node 1 with a positive sign convention shown here. Now, the plate has been given some deflection pattern here, W of X and Y. And we see that that would lead to a positive slope here, which gives a rotational sense as shown. And that agrees with the sign sense of the nodal rotation. For small angles, these two quantities are identical, and they're shown here. And that can be evaluated in terms of the generalized coordinates by taking derivatives of the displacement function. But there's a conflict in the sign convention uh, between the internal plate displacement field and the external nodal rotations uh, in the y-coordinate. Here's theta y1, positive is shown, and yet the slope of that surface is positive upward here, dw dx. Those two are opposite in sign sense, so there needs to be a minus sign there. But that's okay, we can handle that. In order to complete the mapping from the nodal coordinates to the interior field displacement w, we need to use a trick that we developed earlier. And basically, it amounts to evaluating the field displacement at the nodes and then setting the field displacement equal to the nodal quantities there. By so doing, you can eliminate the generalized coordinates. Um, the evaluation leads to a matrix H that we've seen before in several other problems. And uh, as a function of the uh, generalized coordinates, you have to invert this relation in order to use the integral for the, the uh, stiffness matrix shown below. Now that inversion was done by Zinkevich and Chong and probably accounted for a good part of the thesis effort back in the old days when you couldn't do this on symbolic uh, computer programs. Nowadays it's not too hard, but this would be after all a 12 by 12 matrix to invert. The original form of the 
stiffness integral involved the geometric law, the material law, and the geometric again, but there was a second alternate form that was simpler to evaluate numerically because it pulled out the constant H matrix front and rear. The um, internal resulting uh, integral actually can be given in a definition as a sort of a generalized stiffness and you can identify the rigid body modes in that stiffness matrix which is rather useful so there's some reason for doing this in any event so the stiffness calculation at this point is just a matter of doing this integration and then multiplying out the terms. Um, today there's a lot of work in the plate and shell area and uh, many times it will resolve to such an integral but today it would be do done with numerical methods rather than analytically. The MZC rectangle is one of the most complicated elements for which we can show a literal stiffness matrix symbolically. And I think that's still of value. Zinkiewicz did this in his series of books, and I always appreciated seeing what a, a real stiffness matrix looked like. Because of our orthotropic material behavior here, we have created a little more general situation than you might normally expect involving these different material properties across here and then some stiffness matrices that um, are attached. So I'll break this stiffness actually into four successive slides to come. A is the uh, width and B the height of that particular plan form for the plate. Um, L is a diagonal matrix shown below here. The other terms, the off-diagonal terms are all zero. And it's just a repetitive pattern. The first of these four figures involving those stiffness constants K1 through K4 is shown here. And this one involves an aspect ratio squared and this collection of coefficients. Naturally, it's a symmetric matrix, and note that it's 12 by 12. Here's the second stiffness contribution. Again, symmetric, and again involving the aspect ratio, but this time in, in the inverted order is the first one. The third stiffness matrix contribution is given here and doesn't involve the aspect ratio at all. Lastly, the fourth matrix K4 is given here and also does not involve the aspect ratio. There's quite a repetitive pattern in these terms as you might expect, especially for a rectangle um, where there is some um, reflective symmetry in the situation. The MZC rectangle is an example of a flexural plate element and does cover the out-of-plane bending, the she carries shear forces, and is generally a useful uh, bending element. Once you have that, you'd also like to add stretching behavior because in an assembly, each plate might be forced to carry not only lateral loads, but in-plane loads. Now that's done with plate stretching elements that are just plane stress elements. So having gone through that uh, to some extent with the Turner Triangle, we should have some feeling for that. The combined problem, if you put the lateral deflection and then the stretching behavior together requires that you superpose the two behaviors. And when you do that, you have stretching elements, which are plain stress, shown in green here, and then the lateral bending problem shown in red. The stretching problem has only two degrees of freedom at a node, and the bending problem has three. And interestingly, this leaves out one of the six degrees of freedom for a finite element. 
general purpose codes often assume there are six degrees of freedom at every node in the problem. And what we're missing here is a rotation about the z-axis, sometimes called the drilling rotation. Now, some codes will constrain this for the user. Other codes will leave it up to the user. And so you must be aware when you use flat plates that you may have a so-called grid point singularity if you don't take some action to constrain that drilling degree of freedom. There are some elements in MARC that do this automatically. There are some elements in MSC Nastran, uh, particularly a more recently developed one that involves some stiffness in that drilling degree of freedom. To this point, we've been talking about thin, flat plates. Now we'd like to extend the concept into thin shells. Many vehicles, such as aircraft, uh, ships, um, automobiles, have thin shell structures. Pressure vessels, piping, get into shell-like bodies. And the main distinction now is that there is curvature involved, either a single curvature or double curvature. Now, the theory for thin shells becomes much more complicated, and a number of codes have put in thin shell elements. One of the examples would be the quad eight in the Nastran code. Um, but it turns out in practice, at least as of today in 1993, people still prefer to use many flat plate elements and create a faceted surface. Uh, this will represent a curved shell quite well, especially as elements are small enough, because two flat plates that are joined at a common node have the ability to convert the in-plane or the membrane loads uh, into shearing loads or lateral loads just because of the way that these uh, forces intermingle at a node. Now I've shown an exploded view here, but when put together, you'll see that uh, an in-plane force such as this one, when resolved into this coordinate system here, say, will have components in both the lateral and the in-plane directions. Um, after all, that's one of the roles of a shell element is to convert lateral loads into in-plane loads and stresses because shells are much stronger when they can carry these membrane stresses. You know the example of a, a chicken egg in which a person can hold it in their hands carefully and press on it uniformly with great force and not fail the eggshell. If you make a mistake, you get your hands full of raw egg. But uh, it shows that thin shell structures are efficient from a design standpoint uh, precisely because they can convert lateral loads into in-plane loads. In discussing thin flat plates uh, and deciding when they should be considered as thick plates, a common rule of thumb is that the plan dimension must be 10 times larger than the thickness of the plate. When we go to shells, we would have a similar rule of thumb that um, thin shells ought to be at least 10 times in plan view in the two plan dimensions uh, as large as the thickness of the shell. But you also have a new length scale, which is a radius. And really, you'd also want a similar restriction on the ratio of the radius to the thickness. And hopefully, that would be 10 or more in addition. Now, when you violate one or more of these uh, thinness conditions, and you're going to have to think about a thick shell theory. Some commercial codes have good thick shell elements. Others would prefer that you use solid elements. The eight-noted brick, for instance, and I just show a side view here, um, will relax the shear deformation uh, condition of the thin plate theories and thin shell theories, namely allowing shear deformation. If you go to a 20-noted solid hex, and again shown in side view, you'd find that the distortion can even be more severe through the thickness and take a parabolic shape. If you use solid elements to model a thick shell, then there's a question of how many layers of elements do you need for accuracy. 
Well, of course, it's problem dependent on how accurate you need your answers and the kind of elements that you use. Um, I might suggest that you would use seven layers of eight noted um, solid bodies, and those are shown here in the radial direction. Now, I'm not showing the other nodes on this uh, far side. Our layer of elements is here, and I've just shown one. Um, column, you might say, of the nodes. This would give you some eight uh, nodes through the thickness. Over here, if you had four layers of 20 noded elements, then uh, without showing the extra nodes on the elements, which I'll just try to sketch quickly, um, then you would have some nine nodes available. I found myself that sometimes you lose accuracy in the radial direction on such problems. And, and I think it has to do with the, uh, uh, in some cases, with the displacement function that's being used. Problem one in our problem session has to do with the creation of a triangular plate bending element. This was quite a challenge historically for the developers of finite elements. We're to consider the creation of a triangular plate bending element using a complete quintic polynomial. How many nodes would you use and what degrees of freedom would you use? Well, this is going to involve matching the interior degrees of freedom with the nodal degrees of freedom. So in our solution, we start out by looking at how many generalized coordinates there are in a fifth degree complete polynomial. Here's the literal expression for a complete quintic polynomial. And I had to write it out myself to see how many terms are involved, which is 21. So this means there are going to be 21 degrees of freedom available to be sprinkled around the periphery of such a triangle. My, my first model that I show uses an interior uh, node, and that would indeed use all 21 degrees of freedom. I think this would be regarded as possibly the intuitive or the initial standard solution. You'd then want to uh, condense out the interior degrees of freedom in terms of the others by a static condensation. There are other approaches, and I'm just quoting here some people, Olson, Malash, others have worked on this triangular plate bending element. Uh, some of them have brought in um, vertex uh, nodes with additional degrees of freedom. Others have used uh, second derivatives at the midside nodes. So if you carry along a twisting degree of freedom, you might do that, say, at the three midside nodes, and then work with that as your set of degrees of freedom. And so the results on that were non-intuitive, and some of these degrees of freedom are condensed out, and um, quite an interesting approach, rather researchy. But by now there are useful um, triangular elements, and, and I think particular of Merv Olson and his uh, associates when he did his element. Problem two has to do with boundary conditions on a stiffened plate problem. Here we have a plate that's cantilevered from the wall. It has a stiffener also cantilevered from the wall that extends along this boundary. Now the question is, with the nine nodes in the problem, are there any single point constraints required in order to make the problem uh, viable? And, of course, there are as boundary conditions at the wall, and then there will be some sort of conditions possibly either at these joints or at these interior degrees of freedom on the plate. But that's what we have to decide. The first part of our solution will be to recognize that all six degrees of freedom at the nodes on the wall will be constrained. And those numbered nodes were 1, 4, and 7. And I'll just circle those x's that are the single point constraints that are relevant there. Then we have to decide something about what's going on under the stiffener at the left boundary of the plate as we view it. 
and what happens to the uh, nodes that are out in the interior of the plate, the unsupported interior. Well, we're okay at the stiffener because the beam elements will provide stiffness in all six degrees of freedom, so there won't be any grid point singularities there. But those nodes that are out in the interior and are not supported will have to have the drilling uh, degree of freedom restrained, and that's done with these degrees of freedom down here. Those must be constrained. That concludes our problem session.